Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining. This is uh, Strategic Priorities in Practice Session 8, Anticipatory Action with Children for Climate Crisis. Uh, please introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, you can type your name and an organization in the chat box. Also, uh, we have a live interpretation uh, in this session, so you can click, if you need an interpretation, you can click the, the little circle globe button at the, at the bottom, and then you can choose the language that you want to have for the interpretations. And then you can also see the live transcript of this session. And I think producer can kindly share the link there. So you can access there. And then if you need to see the live transcription, you can check it. So uh, in this section, we would like to have some presentations and interactive discussions. Um, can you go to the next slides, please? Yes. So uh, in this session, uh, we will have some speakers. Uh, my name is Chisuri Wata, and then I am a project manager of the Alliance. And then today I am with Garvin Desi, a senior child protection and safeguarding advisor from IFRC, Karen Dahl, a technical manager for anticipatory action, German Red Cross, Dana kumari Oat, a senior uh, GSSI protection officer from Danish Red Cross. And uh, first of all, uh, we would like to do some quiz as an ice breaking activity. Can you share the link? Yes. So if you can click this Mentimeter link, uh, you will see the quiz. Can you, it's, it was, it's, yeah. Can you share the Menti link in the chat box as well? Yes, it's here. So please click this link and then, so you see the first question. So the first question is some data on the climate crisis. So according to the World Bank, how many people could be pushed into extreme poverty by 2030 as a result of climate change? You have options for like 58 million people, 132 million people, or 1.5 billion people. I think we are receiving answers, uh, the polls. We have one, it's Thai for 132 and then 1.5. It's a good guess. We may wait a few more seconds. Okay, 1.5 million people. Okay. So the answer is actually, it's 132 million people. That's a good guess. Um, and then the next question is, how many children live in extreme high, extremely high-risk countries according to UNICEF Children's Climate Risk Index? You have options for 10 million people, 100 million people, and then 1 billion people. One person voted for 100 million, 10 million, no one for 1 billion. <laughs> Any other guesses? Okay, so the answer is actually, oh, okay, still 110 million, okay. The answer is, it's actually 1 billion people and then it's alarming number. Can you see the, can you show the answer? Sorry, because nobody voted for it, it's not showing. It would be <laughs> the one that's highlighted right now, <laughs> but nobody <laughs> guessed it. And I said, okay, so yeah, because it's actually uh, a beyond, our, expect, uh, our, our guess, it's actually 1 billion children uh, living in the extremely highest countries, and it's nearly half of the world's children. Okay, we can move to the next question. The next question is, uh, have, all oh, right. <laughs> okay, uh, the next question is, have your organization taken any actions on mainstreaming climate-related risk and child protection risk in your project? And you can, you, you have the option for yes, no, not sure. There's no right or, or wrong answer. I, we just wanted to do some temperature check. Uh, so if, if your organization have already taken any actions on mainstreaming climate related risk and or child protection risk in your project. We have five answers for yes, one no, one not sure. Great. I think it's good that people started to doing uh, this integration and mainstreaming, uh, but it's 
don't worry for, for people who voted for no and no sure, because in this session, we're trying to showcase and introduce some of the project here, the, the, good, uh, the, the good cases here, so that you can learn from this session. And the next question is, uh, what is your level of understanding of anticipatory action? You can choose it from scale. I, th I think it's one, not knowledgeable at all, to very knowledgeable. So I think it's somewhere in the middle, 3.3. .3. Okay, it's, I think it's in the middle, a bit knowledgeable, but I think we were in the somewhere in the middle. And then I think it's also good that we will, we will talk about it in this session. So you will learn it in the session. And then the last question is, what do you hope to learn from this session? We just wanted to check your expectations. Um, can you open the next question? Sorry. Oops, sorry, two seconds, had it skipped. Here it comes. That's yes, great. So this is the last question. So please type anything. Uh, then the question is, what do you hope to learn from this session? This is open question. So you can type any, any words, any sentences. No expectations. Okay, it's coming. <laughs> to learn about anti-space reaction. Yes, you are in the right session. Great. Anything else? Great. Oh, okay, including including more on anti-space reaction in the organizational emergency equipment and planning, great. Entry points for child protection into anti-space reaction, identify potential case studies, great. I want to learn as a close learning of different places on PGI and in the anti-space reaction, great. Thank you very much for the inputs. So, uh, during the presentations, we will take you notes, know, those inputs, uh, and then maybe we can also touch base on those topics during the discussion sessions as well. Or if we have more inputs, define difference between that. Okay, I think it's moving forward, but it's it's great. Thank you very much for sharing your uh, your answers here. So we will take notes of those. Sorry. Right. So as an introduction, yes. Uh, I would like to quickly share a few slides to explain the background on why we are focusing on climate crisis and then also on the anticipatory action. So, um, yeah, so for sure everyone knows climate crisis is an issue, and but some people may feel that it's something very far or just as problem may happening in the future. But however, as we mentioned in the, in the quiz, uh, so up to 132 million people could be pushed into extreme poverty by 2030 as a result of the climate changes. Uh, and then it's only eight years away and then the impact is already felt by people. And then as I mentioned, uh, 1 billion children live in extremely high risk country according to UNICEF Climate Change Risk Index. And this is almost half of the world children population. And then almost every child on the earth is exposed to at least one of the major climate and environmental hazards, shocks and stresses. Uh, according to this UNICEF Climate Change Risk Index, uh, 29 out of 33 uh, of the extremely high risk countries are also considered as a fragile context. And eight out of 33 of extremely high risk countries already have very high level of displacement. And those are the countries in the dark purple uh, color in the map. And then, as you already know, that countries with humanitarian context or fragile context, context face more risks of the climate crisis. Next slide, please. So this picture is showing an example of how climate-related drought and water stress may impact life of uh, uh, children. And then climate changes uh, disrupts protection system, it causes migration, displacement, and then put millions of children at risk from uh, exploitation, labor, and then abuse. And the climate crisis is indeed a child protection crisis. And especially as you know, uh, the most vulnerable group of children face higher risk of climate-related shocks, and children who live in the fragile context humanitarian setting are among the most vulnerable to climate changes. So we need to act on this now, but the question is how? Can you go to the next, next slide, please? 
So as you may know, the Alliance has de developed strategy for 2021-2025, and we have four strategic priorities as, as shown here. Uh, and in, in addition to those strategic priorities, we have highlighted climate crisis, climate justice, and child protection as a looking ahead topic that we need to start working on. Next slide, please. So you can check more details in our strategy document, uh, but I would like to highlight some key questions from the strategies here. So what does the climate crisis mean for child protection and the future of uh, humanitarian action? How will child protection intervention needs to change and adapt to better respond to climate related disasters? And how can the child protection sector prepare for this change? Uh, how can how can the strength of child protection prevention strategies and approaches to working with and contributing to stronger, more resilient communities and equitable national system be leveraged uh, to support action for climate justice? Uh, we are still at the very starting point for this discussion, but today uh, we would like to learn from some great experiences uh, and lesson learned from the colleagues from Red Cross uh, on implementing anticipatory action project and discuss how anticipatory action can strengthen protection of children from climate-related disasters. Can I go to the next slide, please? Great. So now I would like to introduce Karen Dahl, a technical manager for anticipatory action from German Red Cross, and she will go through general information on the anticipatory action. Karen, floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this opportunity to speak. So what I will walk you through now is the forecast-based forecast financing mechanism of the, um, of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement and talk a little bit about how that goes and where we are when it comes to thinking about integrating uh, child protection. So next slide, please. So what is forecast-based financing? So um, forecast-based financing, again, is, is the mechanism that we use within the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement um, for anticipatory action. And forecast-based financing aims to anticipate disasters and with this anticipation, protect lives and livelihoods. And how does that work? So there are like three main um, components of forecast-based financing. The, three key, uh, the first key component is um, the trigger. So that means that we are, what we try to do is to match forecast information, so weather forecast information with risk information. So that means that we want to understand uh, what the weather will do and not what the weather will be. So the, the, like, the difference um, of, like, or the, the aim of this trigger is to understand at what point do we want to trigger our early actions? So when, like, at what is the point where we know from the past that this has caused a humanitarian impact? And, um, and, and, and with this information, we want to, head ahead, we want to act ahead of, this, um, ahead of this event, ahead of this um, forecasted event. And for that, we want to match the forecast. So the weather information of how much it is going to rain or like where, like where and with what wind speed a cyclone is going to go with risk information. For example, on um, the like risk information on the on the people, the vulnerability of the people, and what would that like? What would a wind speed of 120 kilometers per hour mean for a specific uh, community who is then at risk? So that is on the one hand the trigger. So defining that threshold at which we want to act early. Then the second. Um, key component of forecast-based financing, and that is the selection of actions. So once I know um, my trigger, so for example, I have a trigger of five day lead time, that means I have five days between the forecasted event and the actual happening of the event, what can I do in order to reduce the impacts? So the early actions are those actions that are implemented in between this time frame with the objective of actually reducing the impact. So that could mean that we um, um, we strengthen houses in order for them to be um, stronger against winds. That could mean that we um, give out multi-purpose cash in order for people to evacuate themselves and their livestock and other assets. So these are actions that are aiming at reducing the actual impact. And then the last key component of uh, the forecast-based financing mechanism is the financing mechanism itself. So the idea is that there's an automatic allocation of funds 
once the trigger is met. So there's no, um, there, there, like there's guaranteed funding to, um, like to, to the national society to implement those actions. And these components are written down and summarized in something that we call an early action protocol. So in the early action protocol, you will, you will um, find the justifications for the trigger at what level you want to act at what, like, what are the actions, who is doing what and when, so that all these discussions that we sometimes have when we are responding, we don't have them because everything is already pre-agreed. The actions are pre-agreed um, and we can act just when the trigger is met. So these are, is in a nutshell, what FBF is about. And uh, next slide, please. Um, and maybe to put that into like a bit of a, in this continuum and the disaster risk management cycle in a way, when are we doing anticipatory action? So when you look at this graphic, which I think explains it quite nicely, you have on the left side, you have those actions that actually reduce the impact of a hazard. Then you have the disaster risk reduction, which is more the um, where the activity is more like analyzing and reducing exposure to ha to hazards, but also um, lessening vulnerability. So these are more long term actions that we take in order to reduce disaster risk itself. And then like. And this is different, well, and this is different to anticipatory action because anticipatory action, again, sits in that window between an early warning, in between that forecasted event and the actual event itself. So, um, so the idea, again, is to prevent and mitigate and protect against an impactful and already forecasted event. Um, and this information could then also be used for a um, more informed response and then later, um, I mean, we, you know, at the, the recovery phase. And all of this, like, I mean, underlying all of this is, of course, the, um, is, of course, the preparedness, because that is the capacity that will actually enable also um, the anticipatory actions and also the response. So, of course, um, anticipatory action is something that you would need to prepare very well. I mean, these early actions protocols have to be developed, but they are only implemented once a certain uh, threshold is met. Um, next slide, please. And how does that go? Um, I will go a little bit into like the, the different yeah, implementation steps, like the whole implementation mechanism from where we start when we are setting up an early action protocol to the actual activation of an early action protocol. So what we usually do at the um, very beginning of, um, of, a, of an FBF project is we look at, okay, what are the risks? Understanding, okay, how are the people impacted by which hazards? What are the underlying factors of this risk? Um, and also to understand what exactly is the impact that we want to tackle. Is it when we're talking about, I don't know, cold waves in Peru, are we going, um, I, this is an example from, um, yeah, from an actual EAP. So the, the um, selected impact there was like, one of the selected impacts was the impact on the livestock on the alpacas in the high Andes. So we want to really understand, okay, what, like how are the people in, impacted um, and what can we then, of course, potentially do about it? So this risk assessment, understanding who and what is exposed, who uh, who is vulnerable, and why is this very um, yeah, is the first step of this. Um, secondly, it gets very technical. Um, here we look at the identification of available forecasts. So we would look at national level, at regional level, and sometimes also at global level. What are the forecasts that are actually available, which give us a certain um, level of skill as well. So, I mean, we don't want to use any forecast, but what is important is that that forecast is also reliable. So this is really, um, yeah, a very technical step to understand how good are the forecasts that are available in country or then even yeah beyond on a more global level. And um, once we have identified the forecast and we know how good they are also looking at different lead times, so say, say um, for five days, or is it forecast only good when we're talking about like three days in advance? So this is like a balance that we need to find, right? How much lead time, how much time do we want to have for to implement our early action versus also um, at what, like for, when, when does our forecast still have skill? 
And this combination of this risk assessment and the identification of forecast is the definition of impact levels. So FBF is designed for extreme weather events, like rule by thumb, one in five uh, year return period events. So this event, like the events for which FBF is designed at the moment is Okay, this is this has a chance of happening every five years. So here we then need to define okay, what is the impact level at which we want to act? Would what would be a, like a one in five year return extreme ex, um, return period extreme event that we want to tackle? So what is the impact level at which we would have, for example, in the past um, uh, had a humanitarian response and for which now we want to act early. So here we define that threshold, that very threshold of, of, of acting. And the next um, step, we um, select our early actions. Um, again, um, just as we said before, um, this is um, the yeah, selecting actions that actually reduce the impact. And then um, we would put that into the early action protocol. As you can see here, this is usually a process that takes between one and two years. It's quite uh, technical. It needs lots of stakeholder engagement as well, um, because this, uh, yeah, this this idea of um, of FBF is an anticipatory action is very new in most contexts. So it needs time to bring people on board. Also, because we want, of course, to we want an FBF mechanism to be implemented, in, like integrated into what is already there. Um, I will not go into the other points much, um, just on the very right of that of that scale, what you see there is also the meal component, um, which is very important because we are still learning, right? FBF is still new and anticipatory action, it's still new, there's much to learn. And so one of the key components is also to learn, okay, after an activation, did we like, what is there to learn? What can we do better? Um, next slide, please. And uh, so what I would like to do now is to just zoom into some aspects um, which could like which are entry points for um, PGI and CEA. So again, FBF is quite is, is a very technical process um, as it has been um, as it has been developed. Um, and we had, for example, uh, just last year we had a master's student who look look looking into uh, gender aspects. How can gender be better? Like yeah. How, how can this be, be um, integrated into into what we do with FBF? And um, yeah, so so this was one of the first indications where we started thinking about, okay, how can we bring this better together? Um, and then we also went together with the British Red Cross and looked at, okay, community engagement and accountability, where are the entry points for that? So this is where we stand basically at the very beginning of, um, of understanding, okay, how can we, um, integrate all these cross-cutting issues into what we do um, in anticipatory action. So um, different entry points that you see here, one, um, the like feasibility studies at the very beginning, what we do, which could include already a gender analysis or a child protection analysis. Um, then thinking about the selection of the early actions that could be thinking about the appropriateness of different actions. So how are they like taking into account um, needs of, of children and, um, and gender aspects? Um, and yeah, these are just yeah, two examples. When you look at the different phases of, um, of, of, the, of the mechanism, yeah, you see the gender analysis, you, you see um, participation, which is really throughout. Of course, this is, this is done. We, we work with communities, but in the middle, you see also um, this like red bomb there. Um, and this is, I mean, the constraints that we face, I think, in many projects, budgets, time, also the motivation and the attention in many projects. So um, yeah, we are very at the beginning trying to identify where, where can we come in um, with CEA and PGI aspects. And uh, next and last slide. So um, yeah, current developments in resources on FBF and child protection slash PGI slash CEA, as you can see, we yeah, it's it's very much in 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 one um, box at the moment because yeah, we're we're as, again we're just starting, 
And we have had a session at the Global Dialogue Platform for Anticipatory Action in 2021 last year on community engagement and accountability. And um, there's a Miro board, I'm happy to share the link um, after I finish talking. And um, what we're also working on at the moment is uh, more visibility with case studies and also good practices to really document, okay, what has been done already? Because that's something we also, like we at least it's not visible. There has been done. We know that they like um, in some of our, our countries, they, I mean, of course, those aspects were considered, but they are not as explicit. Um, and then we are also working also together with the um, PGI working group at the Anticipation Hub. We are working on integrating P PGI, CA, and also child protection aspects in the FBF manual. And um, yeah, this is what's happening. And with that, I thank you very much um, for your attention. Thanks, Karen. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, wonderful, fantastic presentation. Uh, Chizuru, can I jump in at this point? Sure, yes, Carpenter, please. Um, Karen, thanks so much. This is really, really fantastic. And you've walked us through um, where anticipatory action fits and um, you know uh, how it's framed, which is really valuable. And just to say a clarity on some of the, the terms there um, in the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, we often use the words PGI, meaning protection, gender, and inclusion, no worries at all. Um, and so uh, in the broader sphere, it's often protection, um, but child protection, a key part of that. Uh, so fantastic. Now, I'm sure after Karen's fantastic presentation, there'll be some questions. So please feel free in the chat box to type those out. And while we're uh, typing those out and looking at responses, uh, maybe we can put up, uh, we have a couple of Mentimeter questions uh, for everyone. Um, and, and we can go through those with uh, Karen's help in particular. Um, but Karen, maybe while we're doing Mentimeter, I can just see if there's any questions coming up uh, right now uh, for you. Uh, one question maybe is just in terms of the scope of anticipatory action. Uh, how many countries are we seeing are applying this method? Uh, you know, what, what does that look like? Um, yeah, so I mean, anticipatory action is growing. I mean, alone in, in the Red Cross and uh, Red Crescent movement, I think it, it's definitely more than 30 countries. But when we are looking also broader, um, with the whole uh, like UN and start network, we would definitely um, yeah see, oops, um, yeah see. I mean, I, more than I think it's more than ninety countries, but I would need mm. to look it up on the anticipation hub. So, I mean, it like it is really gaining momentum. I think it's really um, yeah getting bigger and bigger, and I think that's also great because the um, I mean. Yeah, what, what we would need also is that this pre-agreed funding, and I think that was also one of the like bottlenecks in the in the past, that this pre-agreed funding, like no, like in the past it was difficult to, to obtain funding for something that has not happened yet. And I think with all this attention and more uh, countries and more hazards being covered, that is really a good opportunity to showcase that it's working, but that is also funding needed. Because when you look at the numbers, anticipatory action is still very, very small. Thanks, Karen. And um, I can see that your, your session was really helpful also in uh, in terms of the difference between anticipatory action and DRR, we can see that in the first question. And I think uh, the, the six people who have uh, indicated the purple, if that's correct. Um, could you just uh, maybe say a few words again about that window, how DRR and anticipatory action kind of fit together and are complementary? Um, maybe just a few thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. So, um, yeah, as I said, or as you've also written down here, DRR is a, like is this long term comprehensive approach where you um, I mean, you, you, tr you try to reduce risks on different levels, right, with, for example, contingency plans with um, like, yeah, reducing vulnerabilities of people build it like so that is like, or, or even setting up early warning systems, that is one of the components. Whereas then anticipatory actions, they are only implemented once this forecast comes in. So in a way, I mean, of course, having an early action protocol in place also means that you're reducing 
the risk to a certain extent, right? It can help you to reduce uh, like a residual risk. Of course, in an ideal world, when idea R would be perfectly fine and like everything would be working out, then you would not need anticipatory action. But so the idea is you 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 manage this residual risk that you cannot tackle with DRR. Um, and again, you're using the weather information, which also has not been available 10 years or 15, 20 years ago because we just didn't have that specific and that good forecast information. And now we are using this to actually know, okay, what's going to happen? So that is that idea of impact-based forecasting, right? What is the impact that this um, event is going to cause? And we, are, we, we try to act on this and try to act before this impact is actually going to happen to reduce that impact. So, um, yeah. Uh, could could we have the next uh, question, please? No, thanks, Karen. That's really helpful uh, because it shows that you know these things uh, work together. They're not separate. Or uh, sometimes there's a concern there in competition, DRR and anticipatory action, where really they're all part of the same line of action, uh, supporting each other. Just different parts uh, coming with different. Um, you know, how often is child protection included in anticipatory action? And so we have, um, you know, some answers coming up, which is not often. Um, and is where what you highlighted in your session that there is things like an interagency working group now set up through the anticipatory uh, hub uh, led by Plan International, um, the IFRC and the uh, uh, UNFPA uh, that are trying to develop case studies on this work, but where is your sense of how often are the protection issues of children actually brought into this work uh, right now? Um, yeah, I'm coming back to the point that I that I said earlier. I think it's it's also really about the visibility. I think they are considered thinking about, for example, this cold wave EAP that I was just talking about earlier. And that addresses not only um, the, the, the like the um, livelihoods of the people, but it also addresses um, like respiratory diseases of uh, especially young children. So, in a way, I mean, this is this like aspects of of child protection are included, but they are not visible. I think they, that that's I mean, they, they, if if the impact like comes, it, it is evident that there is a certain impact on children, and that will be considered. But it's not. I, I don't think we we have made that visible at, up until now, and that's why um, it is more like, yeah, it it happens if if the impact is very obvious. And so, yeah, I, I think it's yeah, it's really a question of visibility and documenting what we already have. Um, and that's something we we didn't do again. I think because. FBF is still new. We are developing new methods, new ideas, and it's yeah, it has many aspects that need to be integrated. And I think it's yeah, it's about time that we start working on that as well. Thanks, Karen. And I see um, uh, Bridget. Thanks so much. You put a link to the interagency group uh, in the chat box. So any agency that wants to join that, you're very very welcome. Um, actually, I know participation is really valued. It's a good sized group, but. Uh, there's so much work to do on this issue and this linkage, uh, like Karen's highlighted, that there's some work happening that needs a bit more visibility. And then we know the dedicated, very deliberate uh, work to protect children, we can certainly be enhancing. And looks like that's well reflected in uh, your responses uh, from, uh, from the group here uh, in the Mentimeter as well. So thank you so much, Karen. Uh, and Karen will stick around as a resource for us if there's other questions in the chat box, uh, for sure. Uh, what we'll do now is we'll move into some breakout groups. Um, and uh, in the breakout groups, we're gonna be asking two questions. One is around what are the opportunities we see to enhance child protection and anticipatory action in climate crises? And then second, uh, what challenges as a sector uh, very practically do we need to overcome? Um, and uh, and I see David's comment. So this is perfect uh, in the chat box. We can come, uh, we can, as you have questions and thoughts, please do add them like that. That's perfect. And we'll go into the uh, breakout rooms now. And while you're in there, you will have access to a Jamboard. If you could, you know, just put down your main thoughts in that, that would be really helpful. And why don't we come back in about 
uh, you know, 13, 15 minutes, uh, this kind of thing, uh, and then talk more about it. So we'll, we'll go into um, uh, uh, breakout rooms now. Uh, just an announcement, if anyone needs uh, interpretations, uh, please remain in the main room. I'll send mm. out a, a broadcast as well, but we do have a group in the Sorry. main room and most of the folks have already arrived in their room. So, uh, Chazira, if you'd like to take it away, I'll stop sharing my screen. Sure, thank you very much. So, we have a lot of people here, but I assume that's include the, uh, the interpreters as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, if you can, please turn on your video so that we can just wave each other. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I didn't start my video. I thought I was in. <laughs> so uh, if we can please turn on your video so that like, we can see people around. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Great. So I think we will have roughly 10 minutes or so, or 15 minutes. Uh, we would like to discuss two questions. So one question is, uh, what opportunities do we see around child protection within anticipatory action in climate crisis? And what challenges do we need to overcome? Uh, we can access the Jumbo link and then we can add our inputs here. So I think you can you can access the question and then the, the link to the Jamboard in the chat box. All right, so anyone wants to add some insights or if you have any questions, maybe we can just start asking. Uh, I see many people here, but in reality, not many people here. Oh no, we are here. Okay, all right. <laughs> Have any of you uh, conducted any project uh, or any activities around climate crisis or anticipatory action? Anyone who wants to share some experiences? Or we are pretty much new to this concept, which is great, which is great, and we can learn from the session. So it's great to have that diverse audience here. Uh, do you think of any kind of entry point or opportunities when you, for example, when you uh, implement a child protection project, have you ever integrate climate risks? No, really. Or when you do the capacity building for the child protection workers, do you think if it's possible to add some component on this climate risks and in like a natural disaster risks? Um, impacted by climate changes. Maria, yes, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, sorry, I cannot uh, put my video on because I'm with a with an hotspot on my on my phone, so it's it's not enough the the connection. That is um, all right. About the question you have raised, I don't know if it's going in the right direction, my, my brainstorming, let's say, because it's not really something that I'm, I'm used to do. But uh, I do remember that in a way that was not an anticipatory action, we used to, uh, and not only my organization, but many of our organization, we used to do a lot of sensitization and awareness activities on how to prevent uh, separation of children, for instance, when uh, during natural disasters, uh, actually also, uh, but let's stick to the natural disasters. And um, I was thinking, but I, I really don't know that an anticipatory action could be uh, perhaps the fact of having a list of uh, practical actions that could be done in order to reach uh, within the three or five mm -hmm. days, depending on the time uh, that we have and depending on the quality of the forecast, uh, to actually reach the most vulnerable uh, children, for instance, those that are perhaps, I don't know, in many countries, we, we still have our funnel trophy and, uh, or, you know, um, I don't know, women that are uh, in the, 
maternity in the hospital and you know schools these kind of things but i i really don't know if it's going in the right direction over from my side Thank you very much, Maria. I think it's a good point. Uh, so when you do the sensitization or awareness raising activities for the unaccompanied separate children, uh, for the natural disasters, uh, then that maybe can be triggered when we do the anticipatory, when we trigger the anticipatory action, when we foresee any any natural disaster happening, then maybe we can also trigger that action as well. But the question is the timing. I think it's a really good point that if we can, if we can do that right after, <laughs> in a few days, that uh, that we notice that uh, there is a, there's a high risk of disaster coming in, and I think this timing schedule maybe we can also raise this point to Garvinder and then Karen later, uh, because some of the natural disaster can be predictable, right? Like for things like drought, uh, I see lots of cases that we, because of the, the current technology, uh, we already seen that is coming. Uh, for example, in the Horn of Africa, we already knew it that is coming for a few months in advance or even a year advance. For some things like the storms, uh, like a hurricane, maybe that is a bit more difficult that we just need it few days for the for, for hiding out. But I think it's depending on the types of disaster and types of the climate disasters, uh, maybe we can act upon more area. All right, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, anyone else who wants to add? Uh, may I just add uh, a word on that? Because you were just saying that hurricanes maybe are uh, harder to, uh, to be forecasted, but I think that a strong collaboration with the international services that works on the forecast, uh, particularly of hurricanes, which I can't remember, it's, it's an US uh, website, uh, can actually be of great advantage in order to make sure that we have, we could potentially have enough time to implement anticipatory actions. Because I work a lot in IET, which is openly, and it's known to be a country very much exposed to natural disasters. And the last hurricane, Matthew, no, second to last hurricane, Matthew, uh, in 2016, pr uh, provocated a lot of, uh, of problems, let's say problems, you know, mm. uh, 300, over 300,000 people uh, lost their, uh, their life, while in Cuba, the same hurricane did not kill anybody because there was, I guess now, I can say maybe there were anticipatory action and people have been evacuated and, and all that. And it was exactly the same storms over. Sorry for interrupting. No, thank you very much, Maria, for your great uh, indication. I, I think it's very great point. And then, sorry, my, point, my, my comment was not very uh, accurate or clear. Uh, I just wanted to share like the different time that we may foresee the event, but you are very right that even the hurricane, we can we can anticipate it and we can trigger the actions for sure. All right, anyone else who wants to share an input? Or you can also directly add your input in a jump board as well if you want. Anyone wants to share your input or? Mm -hmm. Miriam, yes, please. Alors, moi, je, je voulais plus aborder dans les sens. Uh, yes, de... I would like to touch upon government um, awareness raising because in DRC here we have the Iniragongo volcano natural disaster that was not forecasted. The population was very surprised and very often children pay the price for it because they do not understand. So I really agree with um, raising awareness for children so that they can understand the hazards, but also do a lot more advocacy with governments so that they could see um, high risk areas and to give to um, officers materials, means to help people to forecast disasters because that, then the population pays the price for it. That was my contribution. Thank you very much, Miriam. I think it's a very great point. 
uh, Miriam Kindry shared the example of the uh, the DRC volcano eruption that was not uh, was not the the kind of they are not prepared and then the focus was not there, and I think uh, as Karen and Galvin mentioned that this. Uh, anticipatory action and DR is not like separate things, but it's kind of in the same flow, but just the timing for the anticipatory action is more closer to the actual event to happen. Uh, and then I think we will trigger the anticipatory action when we know the risk is there, there, but we need to prepare in advance to prepare for the anticipatory action. So we have to have some contingency plan and then we have to have, you know, set up the packages, communication plan, uh, if we, when we trigger the anticipatory action so that uh, we can send out the, the proper messaging to the population. And then to do that, we need to do the advocacy to the government well in advance to the actual uh, the hazard is happening in a pro, uh, pro, protect, uh, sorry, the, the expected. Uh, Elenia, sorry, you want to come in? Sí, um, buenos días. Yes, back. good morning, good afternoon. I live in Ecuador and here we have several natural disaster risks, earthquakes, floodings, many, many risks, and many of them cannot be prevented with anticipated action. So it is important for us, in our territory at least, to have some sort of uh, clear structure and coordination between the different actors so as to provide a swift response to all these disasters. And up until now, this hasn't worked properly. The system is, and, and the assistance quite dispersed, not well articulated. Thank you very much, Irene, for sharing the, uh, the, your experiences from Ecuador. And then I am I myself living in Japan, so I understand that lots of you know natural disaster happening. Uh, and then you mentioned that we cannot prevent those natural disasters to happen, but we can reduce the risk by doing the DRR activity and an anticipatory actions. And then I think the the why we are focusing on anticipatory action is in many cases uh, as humanitarian workers that we often like reactively work on the crisis. So when hurricane happen, we react. But there is something that we can do in advance. So in this session, we would like to discuss on that point. Sorry, I think people coming back to the main session, so we have to close up. <laughs> Thank you very much for your inputs. And then I over to Garbinder. Thanks, Chizuru. Uh, really wonderful. I hope you had some good conversations and met um, some new colleagues uh, from different agencies and parts of the world. Um, you know, what would be great, we have a few minutes before, um, if anybody in your chat box, if you have anything you really want to highlight, uh, but I also see that we have things on the Jamboard, which is uh, really helpful um, uh, for us to look at. Uh, so one of the things that we were just talking about in the group I was in was around finances. Um, and, you know, there's a real opportunity right now um, with the donor community, governments, foundations, and uh, others who really are starting to recognize that, um, uh, that we can't wait for the disaster to happen, especially these climate disasters, in order to fund them, that we want to start funding right when we forecast and we see governments and others making uh, significant contribution uh, commitments uh, saying that they want to see more and more money going right from when we forecast uh, a disaster. Um, and then also some ideas from groups about, you know, working across sectors, working with government and other agencies, uh, listening more to children as we develop our uh, planning, our emerge the, the response plan. So we understand, especially uh, children who are often marginalized. And it was really interesting. Uh, it looks like coming up on the Jamboard, this, um, this very strong link with education. 
that to do the child protection work effectively, uh, we absolutely also need to consider and work very closely um, with those uh, providing education services uh, to children. Um, in, I wonder if through the chat, if there's anyone else who has um, uh, anything else that really stood out for you. I see, uh, you know, the pre-financing seems to be a really critical one. So thank you, Elena, uh, for that. Um, does anybody else have anything to raise before we move uh, to the next section? Uh, and maybe could we see if there was any answers to the question too on the Jamboard about challenges? Yes, the the money, and then you know sometimes the op the uh, time compression. There can be you know uh, what can we uh, do when there's limited time, and of course that's where the link to the disaster risk reduction work is is really important, and then having very concrete things um, that we can do you know, in that in the days, weeks or months when we predict uh, forecasted disasters coming, we really need to have um, some good answers and solutions for that for sure. Uh, fantastic. Uh, we'll keep the information you've put on the Jamboard. This is really helpful. Um, and we really want to reflect on this uh, going forward. Um, and uh, maybe this is a great opportunity to introduce our colleague, uh, Dana from Nepal, who has been working with the Danish Red Cross in Nepal. Um, she is the gender equality and social inclusion uh, lead uh, there. And she comes with a lot of rich experience with uh, different protection and gender issues, including child protection. And as someone who comes from a community is often marginalized. Uh, she's been a really strong advocate. Um, and, and Dana has helped lead some work, really practical work in Nepal on anticipatory action. And, and Dana, could you, would you, um, it's all your, the floor is yours uh, to, to explain some of your work. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Guruvinda, for this opportunity. And I am Dana Or, uh, Senior JC and Protection Officer in Danish Red Cross, Nepal. Now I am going to share our experience in PGI managed teaming in anticipatory action as a good practices from Nepal. First up, next slide, please. Uh, next one, again. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to share a brief about Nepal. Nepal is multi hazard prone country. And uh, here, 90% of population are at high, high risk from disaster. At that situation, children, including child with disability, girls became more vulnerable than others uh, and can be exposed for the risks of protection like abuse, exploitation, uh, violence and trafficking and so on. Because at that time, family, child and system and service provider are not able to provide appropriate care, support and protection. Anticipatory action is a new approach in Nepal. Basically, it is responsible for uh, cold wave and flood uh, under the forecast based uh, early action and soft responsive program project in five municipality of Nepal, which are situated at uh, two river basin. And PGI in it can help to strengthen the coping capacity of household belongs to children. And anticipatory action is a component of ERN. Thank you and next slide please. Now, here I'm going to share some approaches, process, and action for PJ managed teaming in anticipatory action. First of all, under the risk and need assessment, we have collected household disaggregate data of household uh, who are at high risk in working area. Then, based on the vulnerability indicator, we have uh, identified more than 33 thousand households are at risk and they are categorized socially or economically vulnerable. Among these households, 62 percent, that means more than 20,000 households are belongs to children and these households are focused as a first priority 
and prior prior beneficiaries for each and every intervention of early action and anticipatory action. And the data management is a itself uh, an early action that applied for a targeting shock responsive social protection program and other intervention related to the early anticipatory action. And uh, next one is, uh, sorry, uh, community engagement collaboration is a part of anticipatory action that applied each stage of our intervention by multiple consultation, by mapping, by strengthening the capacity of community-based organizations belongs to children. And uh, the organization, the CBOs are mobilized for awareness rising campaign and uh, early warning messaging. And we have doing uh, uh, several advocacy lobby with three layers of government for meaningful participation of children and other vulnerable group in disaster related uh, uh, decision making process and structure. And we also uh, doing advocacy for utilize the social security allowance list for shock responsive, uh, sorry, emergency response and early action. And uh, we, uh, for PGI ministering, we have supported uh, to develop JC action plan. Basically, the JC action plan developed by municipal level, municipal level stakeholders, and they realized uh, that if they develop JC action plan, the PGI is ensure um, in their uh, program, policy, and intervention to address the uh, JC related, PGI related gaps under the anticipatory action as well as DRF. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Sorry, not one. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, under this, uh, uh, we have also supported PGI responsive early action uh, framework in the municipal level. Uh, with the uh, jointly uh, effort of municipal level stakeholder, Nepal Red Cross, we develop this framework. In this framework, basically we ensure PGI in early warning communication channel, uh, temporary shelter, self responsive social protection, food and non-food relief support, and was. Uh, first of all, age for recommendation of community, we have developed, we supported to develop communication channel. Basically, the channel is responsible to deliver message from Department of Hydrology to Hydrology Metrology to municipal level and municipal level to community level and vice versa. In this communication channel, child club, mother group, and other child related network and CBOs are listed as a key actor to receive and deliver message or effective communication in community during the emergency situation. Uh, we ensured PGI in pre evacuation shelter and was by mobilizing PASA trained volunteers to construct safe, accessible, and child friendly infrastructure and by placing feedback mechanism in the shelter to hear their voice and problem. And we also indicate specific spaces for children and child with disability. Under shock responsive protection action, we're targeting. Uh, more than 20,000 household belongs to children for uh, uh, self-responsive multi-purpose uh, cash transfer and also utilizing the list, so social security allowance registry list to identify most vulnerable group uh, for early warning messaging and other support uh, for early anticipatory action. And we ensure uh, PGI in food and non-food relief support to address specific need of children. For example, when we support food, we inserted the lactogen or serlac for the children who are under two because they could not eat uh, dry fruit. And we supported uh, friendly, girl friendly dignity kit for girls and assistive devices for uh, child with disability to address their specific need. Beside uh, of this, we have still so gap and challenge now i'm going to share in front of you please next slide mm, lack of this aggregate data 
it is difficult to reach out all kind of vulnerable group in the community and children are not considered in participation of child cancer decision making process and position in drr related structure and committee and children are excluded from uh, capacity building opportunity like uh, anticipatory action like P, uh, sorry uh, drr related, how to save like this way the uh, anticipatory action and drr related uh, capacity building opportunity children never participate because of their school and other um, lack of uh, information they are excluded and because lack of referral, uh, referral and feedback mechanism it is difficult to uh, effective service delivery and address GBB related case during the emergency situation. And next slide, please. Uh, we have some way forward. Uh, it is essential to ensure community engagement and accountability throughout our activity, uh, throughout our uh, mechanism, approach, and intervention. Consistency. Uh, next one is consistent and continuous advocacy needed to do in different level of government to ensure meaningful participation of vulnerable group as well as use the social security um, allowance list for uh, emergency response. And also uh, supporting the capacity enhancement for target group service provider for mainstreaming PGI in anticipatory action. And next slide, please. We have some, uh, we have applied, we have applied uh, some our uh, useful tools and uh, for, like first is PGI action plan is our best tool for PGI mini streaming. And we have so, uh, developed their certain checklist and indicator in the PGI action plan. And PGI responsive early action framework is our, this, this is PGI responsive early action framework and early warning communication channel and PGI orientation packages our best tools that supported us to minister in PGI in our intervention. Uh, next slide, uh, this is JC checklist. Next slide, this glimpse are, you can move quickly. Uh, thank you all for hearing me patiently. And I am also waiting, eagerly waiting for your response and happy to hear from you. Thank you. Donna, thank you so much. Uh, that was really incredible uh, to see the work that you as the Nepal Red Cross and your partners have been doing um, around this work. And it's just so, um, the way you outlined the really clear structure, you know, you've obviously put a lot of thought into it and found points of very clear integration of these protection issues, the child protection issues, gender issues uh, throughout, uh, you know, you didn't just put it into one area, it's really spread across and you've done it in a very thoughtful way. And you've also, I think, highlighted what are some challenges all of us, uh, all of us at, here today and probably in the sector have around the community engagement really involving children, hearing their voices in defining the action collecting data and really uh, trying to improve the work. Uh, but I also really, I think we all really, really appreciate uh, your matrix. And I, we will make the PowerPoint available because I know probably everyone is like me wanting to spend more time on that because what you've laid out will help all of us uh, in our own work, right? And you've already done some of it um, in advance. So this is, we really, really appreciate this and um, uh, all of the thought and hard work you've put into it in Nepal. Um, it, are there questions for Dana about the work that they have done, uh, her presentation? Uh, please go ahead in the chat box and we can take a few minutes uh, just to go over those. And, and perhaps as those questions come in, um, I can start with a question. And just in terms of what happens now, you've done, you've, uh, you've had this experience, uh, which uh, integrating these issues into anticipatory action. Is this something that will move forward again, you know, as monsoons come, as other disasters come? Is this going to be an ongoing uh, piece of work for Nepal Red Cross? Uh, basically, we are working with uh, Nepal Red Cross, closely partnership. 
And when we implement each and every intervention, we jointly and collaboratively working with Nepal Air Force. And before that, we also supported them uh, to enhance their capacity, to build their capacity in PGI part. For example, this year, we have uh, 86 uh, member of member and staff from the Nepal Air Force. We train how to um, manage team, uh, how to manage team PGI in anticipatory reaction. In that way, we, uh, in this uh, training, they realize it is need to develop a JC action plan at municipal level. Then as per their realization, they develop a JC managed team plan. And based on this JC managed teaming plan, they develop JC managed team plan. They, they put it a uh, specific indicator, how we can uh, verify. That's why in this way they develop and we are supporting their capacity building, orientation, and how, um, uh, and sometimes we also uh, did interaction and uh, consultation with them uh, quarterly basis. Fantastic. And, and this, uh, the emphasis you put on the local work at the very community level, uh, do you have any just um, thoughts about that? What anything that worked well or any challenges for the group about working at the very, very local level? Yeah, last year we have conducted a focus group discuss and consultation with marginalized group, vulnerable group, child club, including most vulnerable group. And there were, they shared that they have less experience or capacity, or sorry, uh, train or orientation about the early action. And for example, there is identified safe shelter, but people, uh, community people are not aware about this, like this type of challenges were there. And that's why it is needed to enhance their capacity because when the capacity limited till the municipal level, but in community level, it is more needed. That's why from this year, we have developed uh, 12 topics. We, on most monthly basis, we oriented to community level uh, community-based organization like mother group, child club, and marginalized group network, indigenous group network, and what is early action, and by inclu uh, inclusive and accessible IEC material, and their learning sharing experience. Uh, and there is still challenge that at municipal level, uh, we have just uh, elected uh, local level body, 80% are new. We train, last year we trained so many person, but this year we still start from zero. That's why this is uh, staff turnover and uh, local bodies uh, uh, member turnover is another challenge for us to convince them and to advocacy and lobby. These are our Thank you. major challenges. Thank you, Donna. This is like, um, uh, you know, like a treasure chest of good information you know like just so much a great uh, experience uh, and maybe this is a way um, that we can hear from everyone else um, of the, maybe uh, just before jumping into that i see some comments here um, there's a question from arpana about do you work closely with the um, the cr committees i guess the child right committees uh, and do you engage, how do you engage with children to hear their voices? Uh, I have already shared that. Uh, we closely work with child club, community level child club, and in school level child club. And there we orient the children through this child club. And we also included child club and child network in our communication, inclusive communication channel, because they are a receiver and sender of the early warning messaging. Uh, when the message comes from the uh, Department of Hydrology Meteorology to municipal level, and municipal level deliver the message at ward level, and ward level uh, uh, responsible person deliver the message in child network. And this child network disseminate the message in their community. That's why we have sensitively in, uh, involved children in our each and every part. Thank you. Again, really practical ways. And I think show again how different maybe agencies could be working together. If there's an agency who has a strong presence in schools and child clubs, 
and another who has a strong um, experience in another area, you know, how can we be working more closely together? Uh, this really opens some questions. Thanks, Dan. Yes, go ahead. One, one is uh, we also involve the mother group, and sometimes we involve to the self help group. The self help group is belongs to the person with disabilities group, and in this group we aware them. And through this group, we also sensitize and aware to the children. That's also our another challenge. Thank you. This is fantastic. Um, uh, Chizuru, did you have something? Your hand is up. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm conscious about the time, but uh, very quickly, uh, I just wanted to ask questions because I noticed in the breakout of discussion that people feel uh, they are new to the idea of anticipatory actions, and then I received a question about the timing. And then also in the jam board, uh, I think I see people asking what would anticipatory action uh, be done in the two, three or four days window that is will foresee. Uh, and then also asking question on the how many things can we do in the anticipatory action short window of opportunities. Uh, so maybe if Karen or Dana can kind of bit, add a bit more information on, you know, I think it's also depending on the, the hazard, the disaster, the the time frame will be different, but after we activate the anticipatory action and what kind of you know actions can be done, if you can share some uh, examples, I think it will help people to imagine you know more what kind of activity they can they can prepare for it. Thank you. Uh, Dana, do you want to answer first, and then maybe Karen? Um. Basically, all uh, anticipatory action in Nepal's context, uh, DHM forecasts the, uh, the forecast about the monsoon before three days. When when we receive when the message received uh, by the DHM level, that comes in municipal level, and mini, the mini, uh, based on this previous experience and based on their experience, they develop a. PGI responsive early warning framework at municipal level. In this framework, they have uh, indicate certain action. First, uh, what to do for early warning messaging, what to do for shelter, what to do for uh, protect their property and their agricultural uh, related livelihood. And this kind of, they, they sort out these action in six part. And based on, they already identified and developed at municipal level. Based on this framework, they uh, action during the uh, emergency situation when they receive the forecast from the DHM. And in this, uh, uh, in this early warning framework, we uh, ensure PGI. I have already said in my presentation, we ensure PGI in five parts. One is early warning communication, early warning messaging. Another is pre vacation shelter and wash. And other is in, in our uh, shock responsive social protection or uh, program or intervention and other food and when we support food and non-food item, at that time we insert PGI and it, the food and non-food support uh, address the specific need of children or not. This kind of uh, PGI related, uh, we insert in this framework. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, what Dana said is absolutely right. I think what, I mean, what, what we need to think about is that we don't like we, of course, we implement the actions in that um, time window of, let's say, I mean, we have different time windows, right? I mean, for cyclones, sometimes we only have 30 hours, but I mean, for floods, we usually have a lead time of five days. And for others, like Philippine cyclones, uh, and we have three days. Then, but when we think about droughts, we would even have longer lead times of uh, weeks. So I think it depends. But what I, I think what Dana just stressed very nicely is this idea of this um, of this framework that the actions are already pre-agreed. So the development of this framework or the early action protocol is actually where all the considerations and the ideas come in and where this needs to be considered. So again, thinking about a risk assessment at the beginning, thinking about the design of the actions, this is where PGI and, and CA um, considerations can come in. Um, and that is way before. And we just need to make sure that these are considered in the actions that then we are going to automatically implement, right? That mm -hmm. these are, because these are pre-agreed. 
Mm -hmm. So um, we don't actually have a huge time pressure in designing those actions. It just, I mean, of course, we did, yeah, the development takes time, but we also have the time because the disaster is not knocking on your door yet. So I think that's um, is the point I would like to make. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, are there any other uh, questions or reflections from the group um, uh, based on those? And while we think of those, I'm thinking myself, we need a proposal to send all 55 of us uh, to Nepal on a learning mission. Uh, we all want to come and learn more from you uh, from all over the world. Um, is there any other thoughts or questions from anyone? Otherwise, what we can do is, I think the last question is really, as we go forward, I think it's very clear this is a new topic in the humanitarian sector that's really been growing over the last few years, but really starting to accelerate. But it's still very new for all of us. And so there's a lot uh, we want to learn, to understand, to understand and see where the child protection fits in. Um, are there any, what would be your advice? What's the advice from the group in terms of going forward? Are there any key questions you would like answered? or key actions you think we should focus on. And please um, just go ahead in the chat box. Uh, that would be really helpful uh, for us as well. And I'm sure for the Alliance, um, as we plan action going forward to have your, your guidance on that. So, you know, are there key questions you want answered or are there priority actions you think we should be pursuing as a, as a sector, a child protection sector to strengthen our work in anticipatory action. And any thoughts come to mind? And while we do that, I think some themes from today that are really clear um, are this last discussion. So Karen really kindly from the start opened up the big picture, showing us how disaster risk reduction is that starting phase of the emergency cycle, but then anticipatory action is that very particular window when we forecast, we, we know or we're very likely to have a disaster in a particular place at a particular time. And so for example, knowing that it's not going to be all of the country, but in these districts, the drought is going to hit hardest. And so when we know that information, we can start taking action. And we also learned uh, through the session that um, there are some really practical things that are happening uh, from different agencies in different sectors as well that we can learn from. Also that we see that pre-financing, this forecast-based financing is starting to really um, generate some momentum. And last year, there was a conference, I think it was in Germany, where governments from around the world made commitments saying, you know, we're going to increase our funding on anticipatory action, you know, this percentage or this amount. And uh, a lot of humanitarian agencies now also starting to make commitments that they don't want to just act in the disaster or as a disaster risk reduction component, but also in this window. And so there's a real opportunity to uh, build in the child protection component. Then we saw that uh, through our breakout sessions, that there are some real opportunities uh, aside from just funding, but you know, really mainstreaming uh, this work uh, and doing it, you know, working with education, hearing from children, working with local partners like government and the NGO sector uh, locally. And then we heard from Dana about this very, um, uh, really thoughtful approach being used in Nepal, uh, you know, based on the local uh, response mechanisms and then really mainstreaming, building in child protection in very, in some small ways, in some significant ways, but including it across that cycle of action. And then we're hearing now uh, that, you know, moving forward, we need to really learn from the global experience, but we really need to also drive this locally 
uh, as part of the local localization agenda really have communities uh, driving this work forward. Uh, there's also some things coming up in the chat. One is, um, you know, it can be very difficult to engage relevant actors and, you know, agree on an action plan when not everyone's feeling urgency. So that's such a such an important point because the sense of urgency can be different um, for for uh, different uh, different actors. But with that in mind, um, you know, we I think there's an agreement we have to learn and have to really improve on that. But we really appreciate everyone joining the session today. Um, and we've got your notes. Uh, you can add more to the Jamboard. Uh, we really appreciate it. There'll be more information to come and uh, let's do more on anticipatory action as we go forward and let's try to do it together. Thanks everyone.